welcome to the Polygamer Podcast, where gaming is for everyone. Join us as we expand the boundaries of the gaming community. Hello and welcome to Polygamer Podcast, episode number 104 for Wednesday, August 19th, 2020. I'm your host, Ken Gagney. A few years ago, I was on a PAX East panel with Anna McGill, a narrative director, and she recently said to everybody, hey, if you want me to signal boost you, let me know and I'll retweet you. And she retweeted somebody with whom I just became absolutely fascinated. The more I dove into this person's websites, portfolio, and history, the more impressed I became with just the variety of accomplishments and talents that they have. So I invited them on to Polygamer and I was delighted to receive a positive response. Allow me to introduce you to the shenaniganist Creatrix Tiara. Hello, Tiara. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. I'm so glad you're here and thank you for bridging the time zones. It's 9 p.m. Friday, my time, and it's 1 p.m. in the afternoon on Saturday tomorrow for you all the way over in Australia. So thank you so much. Hey, you know, happy to chat. And I love that intro. Can I use it as a testimonial? (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Copy and paste it as you like. So as I mentioned, you are a shenaniganist. I can say with 100% certainty, I have never had a shenaniganist on the Polygamer podcast. So help us out here. What exactly does that title mean? Well, it came about because I was trying to work out how to describe kind of the breadth of things that I do, as you probably would have seen scrolling to my website. Like there's been like, I do, I've, produced events I've made games I've written a lot I've produced performance art and it's made me think a lot of the things that you start off as shenanigans like oh this could be fun what if we did blah and then it kind of snowballs and my friends and I actually kind of joke we call it joker festing (laughs) Like, you know, the whole thing about manifesting and the universe provides that always like annoys me to death because but I found we found that anything I start off as a joke snowballs. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, you know what I do? I get up to shenanigans and apparently that works out. So I thought, wouldn't it be funny if I called myself a shenaniganist? And like, you know, maybe I'll take that. <laughs> and so that's what I have, shenaniganist. So if I look up the dictionary definition of shenanigans, the primary definition is mischief and prankishness. Second definition is deceit and trickery, which doesn't necessarily have a positive connotation. Do you get up to deceit and trickery? I did do, my last big project was a stage magic show where I actually interrogate the whole deceit and trickery part of it. So yeah, I get the dictionary definition is uh, leading on the negative end of things, but you know, there's definitely an element of mischief and prankishness too. (laughs) Some things I do, but it's like for a good cause. Like last year, I through a surprise birthday party for a dear friend, Mama Alto, who's like a Melbourne-based jazz cabaret artist and all-round community legend. And she was having like a really hard year. And so some friends and I got together to throw like a very special surprise birthday. And so there was a, there was like this atmosphere of mischief all around it, but it was in the service of making her happy, you know. So in that way, yeah, it's shenanigans because it's like fun, but for good. <laughs> and these shenanigans, when you say they snowball, do they become paid gigs or are these just shenanigans you get up to for fun? Um, It's a bit of both. I mean, some of it is just the arts industry. It's hard to get paid work to begin with. But like, it's, as I said, it's like you start off with a gem of an idea, whether it's, oh, why don't we have a surprise birthday party? Or by stage magic show, we started off as like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if we had a queer lady magician? Because stage magic is very cishet white dude. And to my surprise, a lot of people were into that idea. And suddenly I had a team together and suddenly we have done two full seasons of the whole show. And I just right as the pandemic hit actually was in the west coast of the u.s touring bits of the show and so you know it just started from like a germ of an idea and grew into an international touring show which is weird (laughs) (laughs) like you can't predict these things you know like you can't really plan this out i see that people who are trying to work out oh how do you go viral how do you like tap into the zeitgeist like you just can't plan this you can't plan no. this you just kind of have to throw things in the wall and see what sticks yeah and you know just play the odds and the more you put out there the more things will stick 
Yeah, and it's often like the things you don't necessarily expect, but I think part of it is also just being kind of keenly attuned to what's happening and being able to respond very quickly to it. Yeah, I, I get that. That's the way I launched my YouTube channel. I put one video up that I, I'd never done. Bef- I'd never done any videos before. I put one up just for fun. It got millions of views. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm running a YouTube channel now. And I upload <laughs> another couple hundred. Nice. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I was like, well, I guess I'm doing this now. Great. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> when the opportunity presents itself, you take advantage of it. So you you talked about Queer Lady Magician, and though that is a a proper name, capital Q-L-M, and I love magic. I had, as a previous guest on this show, Susan Arndt, who at the time was editor-in-chief of Genie, a magic magazine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know Genie? I mean, I've heard of it, yeah. Okay. So So I got to hear about the journalistic side of covering the magic industry. I've never had a magician on the show, so... What is Queer Lady Magician? Well, Queer Lady Magician is a stage magic project, which is a queer feminist anti-racist take on stage magic, but also very deeply autobiographical. Like the initial project was an hour long stage show where I go through kind of my history with stage magic. I also loved it as a kid. It was my first true passion. But then when I was in secondary school I tried to do a magic show and it completely bombed on me and so I kind of shied away from magic ever since because I was struck with like this massive fear of failure and you know through the show I talk about like having met um, this woman when I was living in San Francisco her name is Blake Maxim she's like an older trans woman who's also a magician and she got me back into it and then there was the fallout with like an abusive relationship and how they gave me the fear of manipulation But like when you're doing magic though, and that's kind of the art of manipulation, how do you reconcile two things? And so part of it is like taking a different view on stage magic that conventional stage magic doesn't really look at. Like one of my acts is, uh, you know about the bullet catch. I imagine it's where somebody fires a gun and you catch the bullet. Yeah. And so the most iconic, I guess, performance of the bullet catch was in Victorian era by this performer who went by a Chinese name the entire time. And then when he he got killed by that very, say, bullet catch, and in his dying words, it suddenly revealed that he's actually a white guy. (laughs) And so I do, I changed that piece into like, here's the dangers of cultural appropriation. You might get killed by your own magic trick. Wow. Or like my my signature act is the menstrual cups and balls. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, go Which on. Is, well, it's like it, it. I had this brain of like, oh, what if you use menstrual cups for the cups and ball string and then develop like a whole act around it where it ends up being like partially a PSA on how to use menstrual cups while also doing magic. And, you know, we hardly ever see any other stage magicians willing to deal with issues like menstruation. So so, it's a, so there's tricks like that, but also there's like the deep storytelling element of like, how do you deal with failure? How do you deal with the emotionally manipulative abuse in the past? And how do you reconcile that with trying to get back into what was your first love and you've lost it? How do you find a way to connect with it again? And, you know, like I heard making this show, I ma- heard from so many other people, especially like other queer people who are like, I also loved the magic as a kid, but I fell out of it because all the magicians I saw were like white guys and I could not relate to it. And it's been really nice to be able to do this show and see a bunch of people going, oh my God, you've brought me back the thing I loved as a kid because that was the experience I had with meeting Blake, who ends up being a big part of the show. And it was so gratifying to see that I could be that person for other people. So I'm not sure I've ever actually been to a magic show, but I've seen them on television, on YouTube, and I'm trying to reconcile or to figure out how do you talk about abusive relationships through the medium of card tricks, for example, or whatever else sleight of hand we're accustomed to associating with magic? Well, with the show... It's not necessarily like there's a magic trick in every five seconds, right? Like the bit where I talk about my abusive ex who ends up, who actually turned out to be the person that introduced me to Blake, that is more of a dance number. That is not strictly a magic number, but it ties into talking about the larger themes of magic because, you know, in the show, I, this, I do this kind of spoken word dance piece about the ex 
and then in the end go oh my god what am I doing why do I if I had to deal with someone like her who messed up my mind so much why do I want to do an art form that is about messing with people's minds and what's up with that how should I how do I go about this and it kind of fits into like the show's larger story about like oh I'm, this is the first magic show I've done in a long time oh no what if I fail and there's like an assistant character who's trying to murder me the entire time <laughs> and he finally gets to me and kills me and takes over and I come back to life because of course this is a magic show but yeah so so you know stories like that they're less about ooh flashy magic trick but they give you like an emotional context to this journey, like you see, my journey from being a kid magician, want to be magician to like my adult self now. So it's less about ooh magic trick and more. Here's the heart of what I, why I'm doing this show. And where did you learn all your magic from? Um, a lot of it I learned as a kid. Like I had magic books growing up. My dad and I also watched a lot of magic on TV, so we picked up stuff from there. The internet. Um, but when Queer Lady Magician started actually becoming a proper show and not just a germ of an idea. Um, we did, I did like hire a magic consultant, Anthony Demasi, who helped work me through some of like the very specific tricks we need to do. But again, it was like that. And then like a lot of reading, I, like I got a bunch of books and started reading through them. I got my old books and poured through them. The internet also has plenty of resources. So yeah, a lot of it was, a lot of it was less about learning the trick for the first time and more trying to remind myself of the stuff I used to do more often. It's like, oh, I I remember this technique or, oh, right, this is the thing I remember doing when I was like 10. Like, you know, I still had my books from when I was that age and I used them a lot in trying to develop the show and also in practicing the tricks again. Yeah, I find that magic is very much a use it or lose it skill. I've been taught a handful of card tricks and I can, if I practice them, then I can pull them off flawlessly. But if I don't do them for a while, I was like, oh, wait, what? what's the next step? How do I do this? So <laughs> it really takes a lot of practice. It does. But, you know, there's like many different magic skills, not just card tricks, but you have anything from like big stage illusions to smaller, like more sleight of hand things. But one thing I learned from my research into doing Free Lady Magician was that the true act of magic isn't necessarily in the technique but it is in your connection with the audience like magic is ultimately a conversation between you and the audience and you know you could i i there was i went to the melbourne magic festival the year i did clearly new magician for the first time wanted there and watch and there were like so a lot of magicians that i saw were very technically competent but i could not connect with them at all because you know they their stories were a bit like kind of dodgy uh, in too many ways and they were just not engaging as performers and so it's like I, it's like hard for me to appreciate and you're technically doing this very well when it is turning me off as a performer but then there was also this one performer his name is Vincent Kuo he's like a 19 year old based in I think I believe Sydney and he developed this really beautiful routine around Rubik's Cubes like they'll fall apart and come back together and change color and he said it to this background music so it sounds a bit like you're in Narnia and you're encountering a very specific elf and you know when I watched it I could kind of tell like how some of the things were working and it was like his first show of the festival but it was so beautiful it brought me to tears <laughs> as if I started the magic show made me cry and that's where I feel like the magic really is and that's where I've learned also like a lot of like prominent magicians spoke over the years it's like you're basically an actor pretending to be a magician and so much of magic is yeah the technique is definitely part of it but so much of it is about getting the audience on your side and so even if the te like this there's been times like when we did create a magician there was one night where every like we just had stuff falling apart on that day it's like oh no what's happening but the audience didn't know the audience thought I was part of the show you just kind of have to sell it it's like, yeah, totally, totally meant for that to happen. I imagine there's some improv involved with magic as well. Oh, yeah, totally. Like, not just in terms of, oh, your stuff has fallen apart, so you have to deal with it. But we have, like, audience participation in some of the pieces, and so you just have to work with what they give you. And thankfully, our audience has usually been pretty good. But, yeah, as I get, it's so much about the relationship with you and the audience, and so you just have to work with what you get. You mentioned that you were on tour on the West Coast of the United States back in March. With the pandemic striking at around the same time, were you ever concerned about being stranded as a magician in California? Oh, we nearly were. 
<laughs> so I was on tour with Sister Spit, which is a U.S. based a group that for queer and trans performers, and especially in the last few years, queer and trans performers of color. And it's mostly spoken word, performance poetry. And, and I brought in my stage magic bit. <laughs> That's sort of a, a weird one. And, you know, we we were kind of aware of the pandemic coming in. But at that point, there was not like any clear direction necessarily about whether things should ca- be canceled or not. So we did have to, and it was already a very troubling trip because on my way into the US and mind you I've lived there before I've been there a billion times but on my way into LA I got detained at Los Angeles airport for two hours and the detention and immigration officers forced me to perform spoken word before they would let me out I was already like melting down and asking me to spoken word I'm like what okay and then we did the tour and then we had to ca- we went up to Oregon we went up to uh, Seattle and so on and then halfway through places we were going to start the California leg of our tour but a lot of the California places were shutting shutting down because of covid and we just made the executive decision to like you know what we'll just cut our tour short by by half and so we missed all our California dates because of it and then yeah, then I had to scramble to get home because everyone else was just going interstate. A lot of were coming from California. I had to go international. And so I'm scrambling to change my flights to make sure I come back to Australia on time. And every 24 hours or some other news and some other lockdown, I'm just me- freaking out because I don't know if I'm going to get home. And I finally like get on this plane. And it was like the hour I was checking in, there was a big sta- uh, press conference when Prime Minister Scott Morrison was like, oh, if you're overseas, you might want to come home now because we're going to close the border soon. <laughs> I was like, just let me on this plane. So I already had to change my flights a couple of times because sudden 24-hour legal changes and lockdowns. And I get on this flight, on, on this Virgin Australia flight, and as we get on, the pilot's like, hey, welcome to the last international flight. Oh, Wow. I was like, oh my God. And I had upgraded myself to premium economy because I knew it's going to be the the last creature comfort I'd had for a while. Well, I'm glad you were able to make it home because I imagine there aren't a lot of shenanigans you can get up to during a pandemic, so you may as well be home. Yeah, which is, which has been hard. Like, because of Australian lockdown law, the moment I got home, I had to be quarantined at home for two weeks. This was before they moved everyone to hotels. And when you're in quarantine, as opposed to when you're in lockdown, when you're in quarantine, you're not even really allowed to leave the front door. And the only time I could leave my apartment was to go get tested and go immediate testing because I immediately back. And I tested negative, but that didn't cut short my quarantine time. And so I was trapped basically in my house for two weeks. And it was deeply traumatic. Be- uh, especially because I didn't know if it was legal for me to get medical help, especially mental health help, or if I'd be arrested for breaking quarantine. And trying to find that information was like pulling teeth. No one really knew. And uh, that kind of really affected me in a bad way, especially since I'd not even really recovered from having been detained like just a few weeks before. Um, honestly, the only thing, uh, to make a very weird segue, the only thing that helped me was that the moment I got out my first day out of quarantine I went to the local game shop and I got myself a switch and I got myself a copy of Animal Crossing New Horizons because everyone I know was playing it and I was like I'm missing everybody (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome I'm glad that you were able to pull through and that there was a light at the end of the tunnel for you it's a work in progress. <laughs> Let's put it that way. You mentioned having to perform spoken word as part of your entry into the United States. It sounds like this is probably not the first time you've had people challenge you at immigration. This, this seems like it's a recurring theme in you for you and your work. Well, the thing is, though, this is the first time I've actually ever been detained. Like, oh. I have flown everywhere since I was a baby, and I've had, like, difficult passports like I used to be on a Bangladesh passport which meant you need visas for literally everywhere and I'm a Malaysian passport it's a little better but not like you know the best but I never even though I'd gone through a lot of that and especially visa applications that take a hundred years and a lot of money I'd usually been okay like I've usually gone through fine so the detention was like the first 
time I'd really had to deal with something of that magnitude. And it was just, I was like, what the hell? And it made me for the first time actually kind of really fearful of airports now. I know that travel is a really tough for a lot of people nowadays, especially since not only the pandemic, but also just the state of the world and especially the United States in the last four years. And yet you are nonetheless accustomed to being in multiple environments. You mentioned how you have a Malaysian passport. You now live in Australia. You've been to the United States. Where do you consider home? Oh, wow. That is a very philosophical question. <laughs> <laughs> The short answer is I don't know. The long answer is the first place that really felt like home was the San Francisco Bay Area. Like I was there for a summer artist residency to start with and fell in love with the city, uh, especially during that, especially since during that time I was having kind of a hard time in Australia with racism in the arts industry and just being isolated for a lot of reasons. And I went to San Francisco. It's like my people are here and they all really appreciated me. So I conspired to get back. And I did go back nominally for a master's degree, but really it was so I could spend more time there. And I just felt like, yeah, it was like I didn't have to explain myself. There were so many avenues for me to explore what I wanted to do. People were welcoming and accepting. And I'm just kind of sad that I couldn't figure out a way to stay there longer. But then sort of six months after I left, Trump gets into office, so I dodged a bullet. But, you know, out of everywhere I... I've lived in the Bay Area really felt like home and having to leave kind of feels a bit like, you know, those stories where like Chronicles of Narnia or all the other stories where like the kids go through a magic portal and they have these adventures there and then they have to get out and you kind of feel like, what sort of fairyland was I in? It feels a lot like that. <laughs> I also know, like, you know, the Bay Area as it is now is likely going to be very different from what it was like in 2011, 2012 to 2015 when I was there. And so your ideas of home kind of shift over time, not just in terms of temporally, but also just where you are in your mindset, where you are in your life history. Yeah. You can't step in the same river twice. Yeah. Pretty much. I would like to talk about how this experience with travel and with immigration has informed some of your software development. Uh, but I, <laughs> I, yep. Well, you laugh, but I actually want to start with that question, which is in one of your other interviews, you mentioned that your programming skills are from the 1990s, which I can relate to because the only computer I've ever written a program for is the Apple II, and they haven't made those since 1993. So tell me about these programming skills of yours that are so many decades old. Right. So I was on a computer before I could talk, and I know on the one hand, this sounds very millennial of me, but on the other hand, this was like around ages three to four, and I was still an early adopter by that standards. But I learned how to program on QBasic and on Pascal. I used to go to these computing classes for kids. And, you know, at a certain age, they teach you programming and taught you to Pascal. And so that's what I became familiar with. And then as uh, in my teen years, I learned HTML and made a billion fan sites. But that was sort of the extent programming knowledge. Now, in the last few years, I've tried to learn more stuff like JavaScript and Python and little bits and pieces there, but not as intensely as I used to do with like making little games in QBasic or whatever. It's And I feel like every time I blink to some new take on a programming language, it's like, oh no, I feel old and ancient. What? I can't keep up. Like I'm sure if I spend the time just studying it, I could work it out. But you know, I just feel like by the time I learn a language, it's already old. <laughs> that was one of my issues with programming is that it seems like you have to invest a lot to get back very little. And in the meantime, I could have designed a website or written a blog post. And that's just a language that is much more native to me. Right. And, you know, now that you have things like uh, website builders like Squarespace or whatever, it just feels a bit like all my HTML knowledge is a bit redundant now and it can get a little frustrating where it's like i know how to do this in html but you want me to pay more to let me use it why <laughs> yep no i get that yeah so okay so programming may not be your strength nowadays but you have nonetheless been involved in a variety of software projects including 
and this is actually the first time on this Polygamer podcast I've ever sworn. Here's your fucking papers. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I played Papers, Please, which for those who don't know, is like this, re- this kind of indie darling of a game where you play as an immigration agent and in like a post-Soviet somewhere. It's like, oh, you know, you have to, if you don't pass people through correctly or children and your wife are going to die, but there's other people who are trying to be refugees and stuff. And I, everyone around me loved that game, but I wanted to throw that game against the wall because as someone who's had to deal with the immigration system in highly negative ways, I did not want to Im- uh, empathize with the immigration agent. I was like, I don't, don't make me feel sorry for you. And, uh, the, I went to my first game jam in San Francisco, which is an event where a whole bunch of people, you basically make ad hoc groups and you work on a game for like 24, 48, 72 hours straight. And at the beginning, you could make pitches. And so I went up and I said, I would like to make a game like Papers, Please, but from the side of the visa applicant. And so a couple of people came up to me and said, we'd like to make this game with you. And so we decided to make a game which which is now here to fucking papers, which is basically a whole bunch of very annoying mini puzzles about immigration. And so I help, I worked on the design. I worked on the content. Um, the other two, Patrick and Charlotte, did like the coding of it. But one of the puzzles was like this maze where you have to escort a piece of paper around, but the piece of paper always got stuck behind walls and stuff. So you had to go back, pick it up and go through it again. And there was another maze where the walls are invisible, and every time you hit it, hit an invisible wall, something pops and say, "Oh, sorry, you need this piece of paperwork," and "Sorry, you need to pay us some money." And some were exaggerated, but a lot of them weren't. <laughs> and so it just kind of this. And then you had like one where it's like a Q and A, but it's like an immigration crocodile who just asks these increasingly invasive questions. And yeah, so it's basically we thought about what elements of the immigration system I found frustrating and how you translate that into gameplay. And I remember we did our demo at the end of the game jam. And it was some, one of us was playing the game on screen and I saw everyone's faces just viscerally cringe at how annoying it all is. And I've written about immigration a lot. I've made like at least one performance piece about immigration. I've made a video of immigration. Nothing. I've seen has worked so effectively in getting the point across that seeing this game and seeing people viscerally react. And that actually made me re- see like the power of games and interactive media to get people to understand. And even though like the game itself is kind of abstracted, like you're not actually literally filling out visa paperwork, but the fact that it's conveyed in a bit of an abstracted way, but you can still feel emotionally what's going on. I think there's something really powerful in that because you can communicate it rather than just being like, this is what I went through for. Like, oh, that, that sounds terrible. And it's like, no, now you feel it. You feel the pain. You feel my pain. And do you think it's that interactivity that makes it so much more powerful than your other communications on this subject? I think so. Like, it's interactive and, you know, you have to go through it, but in a way that's in that's accessible to you. Like, a game's going to be much more accessible than you're trying to fill out a visa application. But I think also the fact that it's a little bit abstracted get means you get to the emotional heart of it a lot quicker. Like, any, you, got, you might have very different experiences of filling out visa f- paperwork. So you might not necessarily know how I feel going through it. If you, you know, if you're on a US passport, you probably don't need to fill out that much paperwork to begin with. You might not know what the big deal is. But here it's a bit like here is specifically what I how I feel when I have to go through this. And then you as a player be like, oh now I get it. Now I get it what it's like for you specifically. And is this based on your own experience? Oh yeah, yeah. Here's your fucking papers was entirely based on my experience and a lot of the content is based on the kind of paperwork I had to fill out. Like, you know, one of the background images is scans from my old Bangladesh passport. So it is very much rooted in my experience. But in a way, it's also the experience of a lot of other people. Like if you had like a third world country passport, you often have to go through mountains of visa paperwork and no one else has to. And, you know, the requirements apply across the board. So And lost paperwork is something a lot of people have to deal with. So while it is starting from 
well, the thing started from my experience. It's really something a lot of people have to go through, but a lot of other people don't really realize. Why is it important to you that other people understand this experience? I think there's an assumption that a lot of people who never had to go through the immigration system in whatever way, shape, or form, I don't think people really know what it's like. I especially notice with like a lot of pe- people on the progressive side of things who can pity refugees and asylum seekers more like but even then up to a point like you know they're like oh no you're suffering so much you're in detention oh we're not being fair to you but then the moment those asylum seekers get into the country and get residency suddenly no one really cares about them anymore and there's also the assumption like oh if you can afford to get a visa then obviously you're rich and don't have to worry about anything and you know, a lot of these people, their entire exposure with visas is, oh, I'll just fill out a form and pay $14 and that's my ESTA. So they don't necessarily understand why it would be harder for someone like me, say, to move somewhere or stay somewhere. Like when I struggled to find a way to live in the U.S. for longer because I couldn't find the right visa that I could transition to, I had like friends who were grumpy at me that I wasn't willing to sp- break the law to spend ten thousand dollars of my own money instead of getting an employer to sponsor me so I could stay. Like as though I was like not committed enough to the country, and I was like, I don't have any thousand dollars spare, and also I don't want to break the law. Uh, and it also means like I used to get people who are like, oh well, you should be grateful that you got here at all. And I, if you want to complain, and why don't you just leave? And or even stuff like, oh, you should vote. If you want to say like, I can't vote. I don't have the right to vote. What do you want me to do here? And in Australia, especially, a lot of things like arts funding, for example, is restricted to permanent resident citizens only. If you, a lot of scholarships are permanent resident citizens only. And to it, like, the U.S. is a lot more open about this kind of thing, but Australia not so much. And so for a lot of my arts career in Australia, I was on a bridging visa waiting for my permanent residency. And so I was ineligible for anything, which meant my career was on a standstill for years just because I couldn't access all the stuff that my peers were taking for granting or taken for granted almost. And so but the expectation like, oh, surely you'll be able to blah, blah, blah. Because all of us had had to apply for a grant and they had a fresh show like, I can't do any of that. And it's not that easy to get a visa or to get permanent residency. And a lot of it is outside my control. So I feel like if people can actually understand the sheer amount of roadblocks and hurdles and monetary costs someone like me has to go through, they m- hopefully they might be able to think about, well, what other structures can we build so that we're not reliant on people jumping to a million hoops to access the same things the rest of us access? Like, how can we make this process more fair on people regardless of immigration status? How do we make visas more fair? Like, another thing I wish people would understand is things like this talking about, oh, you should pay people for their work or you should pay speakers for talking at your events. Like, yeah, the intention is good. The problem is, as I found out when I got detained at LAX, you tried to compensate someone for speaking at your event, you're, uh, you're going to contravene visas because there's no good visa for I'm here to speak on at a conference for one day. Like it's either a tourist visa, which you're technically not supposed to have a, earn a dollar on, or a work visa, which is meant for like long-term employment and takes a lot of time to organize. And so this the your ideals are on paying people for their work aren't gonna necessarily work unless you also advocate for the immigration system to be easier and fairer around this kind of thing. Do you think that the pandemic moving so many events online makes things more accessible or is that just skirting the issue? It's interesting to see a lot of events having to negotiate with trying to go online. I don't know if it's necessary but considering the issue immigration wise I guess it's more like well they're not having to tackle this issue now and there have been like some events where it's become potentially a little easier to engage like international voices because then you're not having to worry about people's visa paperwork but at the same time it's like I've been noticing 
at least with the Australian arts industry, they've having a lot of them weren't really appreciative about the internet. A lot of them felt like, oh, this technology thing is not real art, or I can't like express my art form properly. And now everyone's suddenly having to learn how to use Zoom or YouTube in five seconds and grumbling about it. And the usual methods don't quite apply. And part of me is like, if you were, if you listened to me like years ago, you probably won't have this problem. <laughs> but yeah, it's just me. I don't know if it necess- I don't know how necess- it's going to be impact on immigration. I think that's in- that would be something we could see maybe in a year's time and study. Like, has there been more international engagement because you don't have to worry about people visa fees? Has it actually not changed as much? I don't know. I think I think this would be a good opportunity to investigate down the road once we have more data. We're not in the middle of a pandemic. Right, right. It's hard to see where we're going right now because exactly. things, things are changing every day. Yeah, pretty much. Sorry, I don't think that answered your question like at all. <laughs> no, no, no. That was a perfectly valid answer. So 2015, that is when you made that game that we were just discussing. And then two years later, you made What the Bleep Do They Need Now? I hope I got that right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm not censoring myself. The game is written with like censorship marks where the swear would be. So I'm filling yeah. it in. So th- I believe that game is about a related topic, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so that was made with through Indie Game Jam, which is a game jam that takes place on an Amtrak train from Chicago to San Francisco in time for DDC. And I got a scholarship to go and around the time that Game Jam was happening, the U.S. travel ban was in place. And while Malaysia wasn't part of the travel ban countries, because Malaysia is a Muslim country, I was worried about whether at something would happen to me, like if I would get detained there or not, um, especially since there had been like at least one Malaysian that got caught up in all the travel ban stuff. And so uh, even leading up to it, I was like, should I go? Should I not go? Will something happen to me? Is this a bad idea? You know, like, even without a travel ban, this is Trump's America, will I get, you know, bashed on the street? And so I went anyway, and to my utter surprise, nothing actually happened to me. And I was slightly disappointed. Like, I like I had this essay plan for, like, oh, yes, I survived a travel ban. It's like, oh, well, nothing happened. What's there to survive, really? But I, when we get to Chicago, again, we had the pitching session, and I said, I want to do a game about the travel ban, because that I had to go through that anxiety and I want to make a game about it. And again, like a bunch of people came up and wanted to help me with it. So we did this kind of this story game where you play someone that is packing their bags to go on this trip and there's a TV and every few hours, every few minutes, very few hours or so, there's like a new restriction or a new something that got announced about the travel ban. And you talk to a couple of friends about whether you should go or not. Like one of them says, go for it. Another one says, stay home. And you ask a lawyer and a lawyer doesn't quite give you necessarily the most definitive advice. And so at the end of the game, it gives you a choice to make, to go or not to go. And we had planned to extend the game to see like like the things you prepared for when when you're in like the first stage, you get the immigration counter and it affects like how you get treated. But A, we didn't have time. And B, really, it's like nothing you can do to plan can, af- can make a difference at the immigration counter. Like you could do the best planning like I did for my sister's pit trip and still get detained anyway. Or it could be like how with the travel, I planned everything and then it never actually came up as a question. So it became kind of irrelevant. And I think just ending it on like a hard, like you go or not to go and then the game ends. That's kind of reflective of you can't predict the future. I remember watching someone's playthrough of it. And she, within the first couple of minutes, noped out. She's like, oh, I already know that I'm going to be uh, denied entry, so I'm not going to continue. And I'm just like, (laughs) you are a white American woman. You will probably be fine. And also, you haven't even gone through most of the game yet. And, and the game doesn't actually decide whether you get in the country or not. But we're just like, within the first five minutes, she already was like, I'm too scared to continue. I know I'm going to fail getting it. I don't want to go in. Wow. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you if there was a way for you to know that you weren't going to get in, then why bother trying, right? Well, that's the thing about immigration, though. There is no way to know. Mm-hmm. Like, 
like you know just in my experience in the US I thought I I was super prepared for su- sister spit and then I showed my invite letter because you, usually if you don't have an invite letter they get grumpy at you I showed my invite letter to the detention officers and they threw it into my face you know like you could be crazy prepared and still not make a difference or one time I went to New Zealand for a conference and I thought, oh, New Zealand's kind of next door to Australia. I'll be fine. I kind of like treated it as like Australia. Like, and I nearly got in trouble because I didn't print out my invite letter. I just showed it on my email. It's like, ah, God, the one place I didn't super prepare for. <laughs> and I nearly got in trouble. So it's, it's really a mixed bag. Sometimes you get crazy prepared and no one asks you anything. Sometimes in one case, they ask me too many questions. You never know. Sometimes it's just like the mood of whoever you're talking to at that particular counter on that particular day. And do you think all this difficulty with immigration is reasonable? Like there are reasons for it? Or is it just another manifestation of xenophobia? Totally xenophobia. Like my, I am all for open borders. Like, and I know I'm kind of maybe an extremist on that point. But so much of visa regulations are based on xenophobia especially when they make it harder for people in the global south to go in because they think oh you're all usually illegals and you're going to come here and destroy our country and it's not that much of coincidence that you're also brown and often or black and or muslim or like oh one of the undesirables you know Like, it's totally xenophobia, it's totally racism and Islamophobia and anti-blackness all mixed in. Like, this whole, like, 75% of the world is seen as suspicious. Like, the only reason you want to be in our country is to, like, drain our resources and steal our jobs and uh, commit crime. And and the visa process um, exacerbates that. It's really dehumanizing. You have to prove that you're basically not going to y- use the country in any way, and you end up with like disabled people having difficulty migrating or even just getting a tourist visa because oh, you're going to be a drain of our healthcare system, you know. And everyone is just seen as suspicious first. Like, why would you even want to be here? Rather than being like, oh, you know, yes, we'll welcome you. Yes, come in. Yes, we would like to make sure you have a good time. Everything is all about, everyone is guilty first, which is very, very, very frustrating. Of course, if you're a white person who wants to immigrate into a country and then embezzle millions of dollars, that's absolutely fine. Oh, that's totally fine. Like, there's uh, like there's so many overstayers, like people who are here on like working holiday visas and then stay a little bit too long, and that ends up being the major, like a significant chunk, if not the majority, of visa violations. But you know, they're not seen as inherently dangerous. They're not seen as inherently, oh, you're gonna like destroy your way of life. But I wish I could say that that's only a problem with like Western countries. But no, like a lot of Asia is also the same like it's very hard to like in Malaysia you know I was born and raised there but because my family were Balashi migrants and they weren't yet a permanent resident when I was born I was considered a foreigner and then only permanent resident when I was six and it didn't matter that I was born and raised in Malaysia and Malaysia is what I know the most I was always perceived as an outsider because the country is very 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 anti-Bangladeshi and so we were always the bad guys again it was like you're here to ruin our way of life you are trying to take over most of you are illegal it didn't matter my dad is an engineer and then turned me to like a managing director it's like oh how dare you be better than us I was in school and straight up the teacher would say to my classmates don't let the Bangla kid do better than you in in their exams in front of my face so it's always been a case of like you're the other you're suspicious and especially if you're the kind of other that is especially maligned you know it's very that's why when you asked about where does which places feel like home it's like a lot of it as well even if I want to call a place home, that place will not accept me as one of them. So what do I do? I'm sorry that you have that disconnect because it, it's important to put down roots or some people think it is. And it can be very grounding to have a place that welcomes you, whether that's because the country does or the people do or it's just a place you can call your own. It can be very comforting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Stability can be very very helpful and not having a sense of stability 
I was going to say it can destabilize you, but basically that's a tautology. But you know, not having a sense, <laughs> I was like, duh. Not having a sense stability can really affect your standing everywhere. Like, it's only, I've been in Melbourne now for like a oh, little over four years, and I'm in the middle of applying for Australian citizenship because I finally became eligible to apply. It's basically a waiting game. I'm still working through it because the app's very long. But it's the first time possibly ever that I didn't have to worry like I didn't have, I wasn't faced with the choice of I have to leave because my visa is running out or the place isn't safe for me anymore whatever but I also don't have to stay if I don't want to like I have a little more freedom of movement and it's it's been a weird kind of a weird adjustment it's like oh I can actually think about the long term now in a way that I could never have before and like I think the only reason like something like queer lady magician was able to happen was because oh I can actually do things that would last longer. I don't always have to work on a six week cycle. This can take months and that's fine. And that's still a thing I have to make it just more for. And now it's like oh the pandemic has thrown all of that on its head again. So who knows now? No, I get that. I move every two to three months and I know. There are some things I can't do in a space of two to three months because I'll only have gotten so far into a project before it's time to pick up and move again. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's one other game I want to ask you about, which is Escape from Womb Era, which was made 16 years ago. And now there's an event coming up in October based on that called Return to Escape from Womb Era. So, what, what is this game and what is this event? Oh, so Escape from Woomera is a game that was made where you play some a refugee in a detention center and you basically literally try to escape the detention center. And it was made in consultation with the people at this detention center, but even when it was made, it was controversial in a lot of ways. Some people thought it was a really good way to experience, to know what it's like in this detention center. Some people thought it was trivializing it. Some people did not like that, oh my God, you're talking about this controversial topic, how dare you? And it was so controversial that the Australia Council for the Arts refused to fund any other game related project until they funded the Free Play Independent Games Festival last year. Like it took them like that 15 years for them to be comfortable funding any sort of games thing again. And Return to Escape from Umara actually was like kind of part of one of the events last year. It's a group. I believe the name is Apple Spiel. It's a group based in Sydney that where they do like a retrospective of Escape from Woomera. And so there's a part where they do like you can, they get people in the audience to play the game and they do like a little bit like sports style commentary about how the player is doing with the game. But while the player is playing the game and everyone's watching the progress, they also have a panel discussion and about, the arts, immigration, games. And when they first did the Return to Escape Rumor event in Sydney, I got invited to be a part of the panels because there were hardly anyone else who was sitting in the intersection of immigration and games. It was like me and maybe Lucas Pope are like the two people. And so I got to be in a couple of the panels. Like one of the panels was me and a couple of other immigrant artists. And so we talked about immigration and the arts and how that intersects together and the other panel I was on was with Julian Burnside who is this very well-known lawyer who's worked with uh, refugees and asylum seekers and has been part of a re a few like landmark cases around this and when I found out I was on a panel with him I was like oh my god why am I on the panel with this guy ah you possess him but it was kind of an interesting discussion that we had about like immigration from the perspective of someone in the system versus someone kind of working outside the system. And well, not outside, but you know, like Julian Birdside isn't dealing as an immigrant. He's a lawyer advocating for immigrants. So uh, talking about the legal issues thereof. And so, yeah, so uh, there's been an event in Melbourne a little while ago and it looks like they're bringing it back again. But yeah, it's a way to explore the effects of that game and on arts funding and funding controversial art and funding political art and also how do you depict politics in games specifically and just like how do immigrants make art and it's been like a few different ways i remember going to the one in melbourne and they had a panel 
that had at least one person who was a refugee and she was talking about on her bridging visa she was like not even allowed medicare access like at least i had medicare which was a godsend but she wasn't even allowed to access healthcare on her bridging visa and talking about how people like her get left out out of a lot of uh oh yes help the refugees and like yeah you only help them with dinners and stuff but not anything super practical long term so yeah i think uh it's an event where you get all of these perspectives together to talk about different aspects of using the game as a base but this branching off to a lot of related topics about it and it's not solely a retrospective on a game that was relevant 16 years ago this game is still relevant today yeah absolutely especially you know like our ref- the australia's refugee and asylum seeker policies are still like very very restrictive if anything even more so like we have a government campaign literally called you will not make australia home you know like it's still like nothing has improved really and so the there is perhaps a need still for something like return to escape from no return something like escape to umara like whether that is a game whether that is some other media and you know does it need to be an interactive experience for people to relate like how much like i feel like now there's a lot more people on the ground that have a better understanding perhaps than they were maybe 15 years ago but a lot of it is structural like how do you get governments to care and it has been especially frustrating in the last australian election leave last year i went through the policies of just about every party that was running and i decided to look at what everyone's immigration policies were and the vast majority of them were anti-immigrant like it didn't really matter what your core policy is like environmental parties were like we have to solve climate change by blocking immigration or oh we're the secular party and so you want to support freedom of speech let's ban burqas you know and so much of it and you see right now with like who's in power nowadays the US election Britain with Brexit, Australia even so much of it has been rooted in anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, anti-asylum seeker sentiment like oh no we basically we need to keep the outsiders out one way or another and it ends up affecting us in really insidious ways. So there's one more game project I want to talk to you about and I so we've been talking about immigration and the challenges thereof and how games can be used to progress this social cause. This one is might maybe just a little bit lighter. So how much do you want to tell us about this? Well, I did mention the f- one thing that really helped me recover from uh, forcibly being quarantined for two weeks was buying a Nintendo Switch and getting a copy of Animal Crossing New Horizons. And I've played a little bit of Animal Crossing before, but this was like the first one I've really sunk my teeth into it. And... I loved how interactive it is, and I really loved how some uh, many players have used Animal Crossing as an avenue to host events on it. And I thought, what if I tried to host a show via Animal Crossing? And it looked like it technically was possible. And then later, I see like people like Gary with us, Animal Talking, uh, which is like an entire talk show entirely on Animal Crossing, and he's gotten like big names on it now. Um, there's been like another artist that's done comedy shows on it. There's like people who've done like fashion shows. So so, it's, so initially, I, was pla- I pitched a thing for Melman Fringe about what if I did a show on Animal Crossing, lo 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 lo. As in the tradition of things that start off as shenanigans and then snowball, this is another one of them. <laughs> the most I can say because we are on our embargo technically till October, is that. Their Animal Crossing New Horizons is coming to Melbourne Fringe in a really, really, really big way. And I think about basically a fringe festival within Animal Crossing. That is that and it's I've been working on it slowly and I'm still very surprised that I'm getting to do this. But we we bring Animal Crossing to Melbourne Fringe and to future festivals as well. We've got one other festival interested. So that is awesome. Where can pe- now is there a place online where people can follow this Animal Crossing project, or do you want to send them to the Melbourne Fringe website? Oh, it's not on the Melbourne Fringe website yet. Um, I'm still working on like a online base for it. But if you you can sign up for updates on acnhfringe.substack.com. 
So that's probably probably the best way. I'm still working on like an actual proper landing page for it. But yes, sign up to the Substack newsletter, acnhfringe.substack.com, and you'll get some insight into what exactly is happening. Excellent. I will include a link to that in the show notes. So one last question before we go. You talked about how powerful the visceral medium of video games can be, but we also talked about so many other things that you do, including magic. If you had to choose just one of your many forms of shenanigans, just one medium that would be your favorite, would you be even able to choose from so many? Like, What is your favorite if there is one? My favorite would be bring together things in unexpected ways, like the whole point of the way I work is that I bring together different forms and mediums into something new. Like trying to pick one is slightly besides the point. You know, I've always been about melding things together and looking at not so see in form, not just like, oh, I want to do an art piece or I want to do a performance piece, whatever, but just like, what is something about this topic I want to explore? Whether it's, oh, what if um, there was a queer lady magician who was as well known as the cis head white dude magician? What's that like? Or what if Animal Crossing but a fringe festival? You know, like just it's less about that's my favorite thing. My favorite thing is trying to see what unexpected things lie behind something and running with it. No, I get that. That makes perfect sense. I love that answer. Thank you. I'm somebody who enjoys a variety of media myself. I have a YouTube channel. I edit podcasts. I publish a print magazine that actually goes in the mail. And they all feed oh, off wow. each other. You know, you, you, if somebody oh, yeah. would ask me to pick just one, I was like, well, you can't do one without the others. It's all part exactly. of one body. Yep. Exactly. And like, you know, people try to sometimes ask me, like, how, why do you do so many things? Or how do you do so many things? But as you said, they all feed each other. You know, mm-hmm. like my games work informed queer lady magician in a lot of ways. Or like my stage work informs you know, like my approach to like a free festival project involving a video game. Like they all kind of feed within each other, even if the influence is not necessarily that explicit. I love it. Well, I'm not quite at the point of calling myself a shenaniganist. I'll leave that to the professionals. Um, <laughs> It's been such a pleasure to learn more about you and your many crafts. So for those who are also as equally fascinated as I am, where can they follow you online? I am Creatrix Tiara pretty much anywhere, but especially at creatrixtiara.com or you can follow me on Twitter at Creatrix Tiara. Say hi. Very good. I'll include a link to that in the show notes. Creatrix Tiara, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. This has been Polygamer, a GameBits production. Find more episodes, read our blog, or send feedback at polygamer.net.